delegates to kindly settle down and keep their cell phones on the silent mode. Once again, we're about to start up shortly, requesting all the delegates to kindly settle down and keep their cell phones on the silent mode. All excited for the most interesting session of this summit. Well, there's a saying in English, life is a series of experiences, each of which makes us better, even though it's hard to realize this. Over the years, Sankalp Award has come to be known as one of the most prestigious social enterprise awards in India that has consistently recognized the most sustainable business that are creating impact. Today, the Sankalp Award 2013 finalist from the five high impact sectors and two special categories will pitch before you their ideas for impact. You will also find in your delegate bag a special edition by the Entrepreneur magazine that features each of these companies. Without any further delay, I would now like to invite on stage Mr. Suresh Venkat to take forward the session and moderate it. And could we please welcome him with a huge round of applause. Check. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi once again. Welcome to the Ideas for Impact session. Now, these finalists, 26 of them, uh, have been identified and mentored by Sankalp and Dasra, uh, mentored in their presentation, mentored in refining their business pitch. So here's what will happen. There are multiple categories. I'll be inviting entrepreneurs category-wise. Each one gets 90 seconds. That's one and a half minutes to pitch their business idea to you. After which, we'll play a short video about the business. After which, luckily for you, you know that ragging is banned in most Indian colleges. And for those of you not from India, it's called hazing, I think, in America. Uh, the good news is you can rag the entrepreneur today after that. You'll get three minutes to rag the entrepreneur, to ask them questions, and to uh, grade them in your head and for the audience in public. For the entrepreneurs themselves, they need to be extremely disciplined. It's going to be 90 seconds of pitch time, one minute of video time, and three minutes of question time. Right, with that, let me tell you who the first category is and the first entrepreneurs. The first category, of course, is agriculture, food, and rural business. And the first entrepreneur you're going to meet is the team from Barracks Agro Sciences. Barracks Agro, can we have you on stage? Very good afternoon, audiences and our de delegates. Yeah, this is Barracks AgroSciences Private Limited for you. I hope we had a great lunch in the afternoon provided by Sangal, but we do not go for the cat nap now because I have some serious issues and news information for you for our next day food. Yeah. Did you know about it is a fact that Indian farmers are suffering more than $10,000 billion worth of crop damage every year? And even after using the 30, $360 million worth of pesticide every day, every year, yeah. And also, what the food we are consuming the next day and the coming days are fully loaded with the pesticides. So this pathetic and alarming situation made the barracks to come out with a solution. Yeah, yes, we came out with a solution, a patent and technology, which is having the trap, which is carrying the... Yeah, which is having the... It is slowly emitting the female sex, insect sex emitting pheromone, which is uh, signaling and calling the, all the males to come and attract and kill by that. So there is a huge amount of the crop is saved and the farmers is saving a huge amount of the money on the crops he spent. And also our health for the future is saved. As per our impact so far is, we serviced about more than 25,000 acres of the land and also we have more than 15,000 farmers, our customers, having the 90% acceptance from them. And also now we are planning for our future that we will be targeting 1.5 lakh farmers and three and the entire pan-India level market and also saving the whole Indian community health and wealth. Barracks, your time is up. You get 20 seconds to complete that sentence. Yeah, we are acknowledged for our business innovation and the novel products with an award and SIDBI as well as the power of idea by Indian Institute of uh, I mean, Ahmedabad. Thank you very much. Come and uh, help us to support our science and technology to work for the poor and the farmers. Can we have the video, please? Not playing the video now? Okay. 
We're not playing the videos now. All right. So questions for barracks. Put your hand up. You have three minutes for question answers. Anything that you want to know about pheromones and pesticides? Any questions? Yes, gentlemen in, yeah, oh, it'll come. How you are different from PCI and other in the same space? Yeah, we have a patented technology that pheromone suffers a great difficulty and also the problem of its releasing factor. Because the pheromone has to be in the environment at the particular concentration and also throughout the crop period. The PCS, whatever other period our competitors are selling, is a burst release. Like uh, if you spray that uh, deodorant on your body, it will evaporate immediately without using any help. But our novel technology, it releases very slowly and it covers the entire crop period and also the entire variety of the food crops and also the vast area of cultivation. With uh, only two traps per acre against 10 tab, I mean, traps provided, recommended by the other competitors. So that the farmers is saving more than 30,000 rupees worth of, I mean, I mean uh, money, you know, in uh, investing on the other pest traps. Yes, gentlemen in the, yeah, we'll come to you next. Can we pass the mic to? How do you plan to counter the existing company's lobby in this space? including a threat to your uh, own credibility? Yeah, I can say that the, our own, I mean, our uh, main competitors as well as the rivals in the field is the pesticide companies. Because we are, it is a nature's friendly and working against that. But we already succeeded by changing the mentality of the sector already <coughs> where we are present at present, the three states and 16 districts, by providing the live demo to the farmer. If you keep our uh, traps along with the other traps as well as the other any pesticide, pesticides you cannot see that, uh, you know, decrease in. Actually, as per the U.S. Uh, agriculture department, only 2% is actually killing. The rest of the 90% is actually coming back to us in the form of food and water contamination and killing. It acts as a biocide to the human being on the earth, actually. This is a fact, and also the farmers are seeing the effect before his eyes. If you keep that our product for the two minutes in the crop period, within the two minutes period, you can find all the pests are attracted and killed before his eyes. So the farmers itself are creating the demand to the distributor. But we are going through the distributor, and even though the distributors are the major beneficiary from the pesticide industry, we got the exception from them 65% so far by providing the more and more pheromone products and creating the awareness that uh, we can able to achieve, we are optimistic that we can achieve 100% acceptance from all the industry. Because the regulatory, the worldwide, as well as the Indian government, the biotech society also going to adopt this product under the biotech in the recent years. Yeah. Right, I'm sorry, we have to end this. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Barak Sagro. Hello. May I invite our second finalist? It's called Eco Tussar Silks. They produce exclusive textiles and home fashion and fashion products for the urban Indian market by offering market linkages to rural artisans, focusing on production processes that are pro-poor. Can we have the team from Eco Tussar Silks on stage? Excellent. When you're ready, your time starts approximately now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Almost 2.5 million hand weavers in our country are facing increasing poverty because they are losing the battle from machine-made textiles. eco Silk is trying to reverse the tide by leveraging the strength of handloom sector, which is ability to produce small, customized lots. And this ability, coupled with good design, robust marketing, and use of technology, is helping us build a business, which is, as of last year, fiscal, has impacted 3,000 producers in the value chain. Last year, we did a top line of 22 million US dollars, out of which almost 7 million US dollars was pumped in as wage in the hands of the producers in the pipeline. Interestingly, handloom promotion also helps create demand for handmade yarn, which is a very robust livelihood option for women who are otherwise illiterate living in remote villages. We have trained more than 3,500 women in Jharkhand and Bihar who are making silk yarn which 
they are selling to us as well as others for making and living. One very interesting fallout of this project is that uh, these women, since they have cash wage opportunity in the village, are now avoiding the scrooge of forced migration to cities for search of work in non-agri... Your time period. is up. We'll let you finish that sentence okay. and open yourself to questions. Uh, it's our vision to impact 100,000 families by the year 2025 by growing this business. Thank you. All right. So questions? Do we... Uh, questions for... Sorry, I didn't get your name, sir. I'm Hitesh Pandya. Hitesh Pandya. Hitesh Pandya. Hitesh Pandya. Right. Any questions for Hitesh? Sorry, am I getting the name wrong? Okay. That doesn't matter. Mr. Pandya, sorry. I have a question for you. How are you different from the cooperative movement? A lot of the things that you describe are the essence of the handicraft cooperative movement and the handloom cooperative movement. Yeah, well, movement. see, I would actually be happy if uh, there are more people like us. Okay. Because the more people who work in this field will create more work for handloom people with their effort. And so, you know, we are no different as uh, excepting for the fact that we are totally profit-making company since inception. Okay. And uh, we are very proud to say that last year, our profit before tax was almost 20% of our top line. Right. Any questions from the audience? Yes, the lady on the far right. Um, your name Could I request you to stand up? It will be easier to, for him to see who is um, speaking. Um, your name has eco in it, eco tusser silk. So what part of this is uh, eco exactly? Oh, well, it's actually funny because, you know, we went with tusser silk because tusser is our brand name, which is a generic uh, name of the category. And we were disallowed by the company's board. Uh, so we added eco to it because it's an economic opportunity for the producer. So there's no specific reason. <laughs> <laughs> eco as an economic, not ecological. <laughs> one more question. We have time for one more. Ask harder questions. These are too easy for the entrepreneurs. <laughs> okay. And yes, uh, but to the unasked question, we make a lot of saris. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you. Have you done? Thank you. Thank you. Right, our next finalist is called Fabric Plus. They produce exclusive fine yarn of Eri and Muga silk by building market linkages for silk weavers and growers from Northeast India. Can we have the team from Fabric Plus, please? Namaskar. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dilip Barua. I am the Managing Director, Fabric Plus, Assam. Uh, but our business is all about applying the most appropriate technology into the ancient art of producing airy silk that was never attempted because of lack of professionalism. Thanks to our textile background and years of exposure and also the commitment of our team, airy silk which is the only naturally occurring ahimsa or non-violent or cruelty-free silk that is produced only in the northeast of India. We had ignored the potential of this silk. However, with the growing awareness about what an eco-friendly textile means, we are confident that it is going to become one of the most wanted silk in the world. We have so far been able to pioneer, pioneer it and impact 20,000 families out of which 65% are women. And with, with a business turnover of about 12 crores and with an additional investment of about 16 crores, we are confident to bring it to the next level and impact more than 100,000 families in the rural northeast of India. Your time's up, We sir. invite you to be a part of our journey and enjoy. Thank you very much. All right, perfectly on time as well. Right, any questions? What's your name, sir? My name is Dilip Barua. Dilip, any questions for Mr. Barua? Any questions about how they do their business, how they're profitable? Yes? Just wait for a mic to come to you here on the first row. Silk has been being produced in various ways. How do uh, your company impact, uh, social impact, 
Can you elaborate a bit? It's quite transformational. We have an exclusive silk which is not grown elsewhere in the world. This is a typically or naturally occurring ahimsa silk and which has been produced only in the northeast of India, in the rural sector of the northeast. And in the, the production capacity is about 3,100 metric tons, which is impacting actually about 2.5 million people in the northeast. We are trying to do, what we have done is that we have taken that help of technology and made it possible to spin very fine yarn and increasing the yield per kilogram of the raw material from 3 meters to 25 meters because we could spin very fine yarn with Japanese technology imported from China. And that's how it is impacting, uh, that's, how it is imp that's how it is impacting in the, in the social sector so that they are earning, otherwise they were doing hand spinning of yarn and producing on handlooms. Now they are producing, they are, they are taking our yarn and taking to the handlooms and producing about seven meters. They used to produce about 1.5 meters. So the number of weavers, they are not spending time, they are not spending time on hand spinning, but spending time on weaving more yardage and making more money. Got it. Last question, when you say it's naturally occurring silk, where does the silk occur? It's uh, naturally occurring means it has a special characteristics to spin, unlike mulberry or tassel or muga. There are three types. Not from a silkworm? Uh, it's from the silkworm. Then how is it and ahimsa then, if you kill the silkworm? The, the spinning technique is different. How they is it ahimsa? Spin, they don't spin round. How is it ahimsa? You have to still, still kill yeah, the silkworm. They, they, they leave a hole. And the silkworm leaves? Silkworm leaves. All right. So then it's ahimsa indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much. Barua. Our next finalist is called Vindhya Infomedia. They're a rural BPO that focuses on working with microfinance institutions in Karnataka, and specifically they employ people with disabilities. So the stage is all yours, and when you're ready, the time will start. Your 90 seconds starts when you start speaking. A very good afternoon. So in a country like India where 10% uh, of population live where people are disabled, this is where we are addressing, and very few believers in their ability. So I represent Vindhya Infomedia, uh, where a BPO enabled by differently enabled from Bangalore, where we are into a spectrum of services from data processing to voice-based solutions, creating a blend of business and philanthropy. So through this vision of employing people with disabilities as our 90 percent of our employees are people with disabilities who've been doing our lot of processes which includes both voice and non-voice sector which is again allowing them to live a life with dignity and definitely not charity. So Vindhya started with two people in the year 2006 and now growing towards 450 people in servicing various sectors from microfinance, banking, digitization, corporates and also very niche services in the voice by providing support in 11 different regional languages. So Vindhya has been recognized by various channels of media and been awarded Shell Helen Keller Award, NDTV Profit Leadership Award and definitely recognition from NASCOM and other organizations. So the vision is to be the largest social enterprise. Currently it is at 5,000 people is what we want to be in the next three years and we want to have a qual high quality service to our customers by also putting our employees first and giving them a life of dignity and self-respect in their life. Thank you. All right, just in time. So questions for Vindhya Infomedia? Anybody has experience in working with people with disability? Hi. Uh, Sorry, can't see you. Where are you? Yeah. Here. Yeah. So nearly 4,500, uh, 4,500 is the number of employees in your company with disability, right? 450. 450? Yeah, 450. 450. Okay, and your office is disabled friendly? Like, uh, do you have specially enabled infrastructure? Yeah, uh, yes, definitely. Uh, our office is disabled friendly, but another one point I definitely want to make here is we're all Indian. I mean, we being in India, uh, I mean, this has come from my, our employees. None of Indian roads are disabled friendly. 
none of Indian offices are disabled friendly or houses are disabled friendly. The only thing which they are looking at is opportunities. So once they are there, everything becomes disabled friendly. So this is what we want and this is how we started. Good. Do you employ disabled people because they are more productive at the jobs? or because you want to create a social impact with the disabled or the differently abled? Initially, we wanted to create impact, but later we realized that they're more productive. Why well. do you think they're more productive than regularly it, able it is, employees? It is very obvious. Uh, first, I'll just take a few examples. If it is a hearing impaired, uh, for example, I and you have a lot of distractions, so hearing impaired doesn't have any distraction. So obviously, the productivity is much higher. And if it is a physically challenged person who's sitting on a wheelchair, it doesn't allow him to get out for a smoke or a gossip. Okay, so you get points for being honest about it. There's a foot massage uh, chain, I think, in Bombay that employs blind people. Yeah. Merely because blind people's sense of tactile feedback is much better than regularly able people. Yes. So nobody's doing anybody any favors here. You're Definitely employing them because not. they're better at their job yeah. than a regularly able person. That's why we're a profitable organization and we're all doing the same. And this so all thing one, one thing, I'm so sorry. One thing is that, see, we always think that they're differently able. We're all differently able. There's a scene, ours is not seen. That's it. All right. Yeah. One more time for one more question. Anybody? Yes. Gentleman there in that row. Could you stand up, sir, so we know? Yeah. We'll wrap it up after this question. I know most of the Indian roads are not uh, disabled friendly, but are you taking any efforts to reach these people so that they can be commuting is more? Definitely yes. For our employees, we are making uh, options in terms of people who are highly crippled. We are uh, supporting them with vehicles. Uh, definitely uh, that's on an interest-free loan and we're not giving it free because anything which comes free will not have a value. So they get their own vehicles and they're not no more dependent on public transport and they're on their own. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank all. you. Well said. Our next category is health, water and sanitation. Our first entrepreneur in this category is Axio Biosolutions. So, Leo, if we can have you on stage. Axio Bio develops innovative technology using needles and gasification. Sorry, sorry. They're innovators and manufacturers of Axiostat, emergency hemostatic dressing to prevent bleeding. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, so in India, every year about 150,000 people die on road accidents, out of which about a lakh people die only because they couldn't control bleeding at the accident spot until the medical help arrived. Worldwide, out of two soldiers dying in the battlefield, one die of traumatic bleeding. I'm Leo from Axio Biosolutions. We are proud to introduce Axiostat. This is India's and Asia's first emergency hemostatic dressing. This is a bio dressing that can stop profuse trauma bleeding within three minutes of application. It's currently the most affordable trauma hemostat in the world. It's been clinically validated, patented product, already being used by the leading hospitals in Delhi, Gujarat, and as you speak, the paramilitary forces in Chhattisgarh, they carry this in their on-field kit for the Maoist trade. We have already been, so, we have already been uh, recipient of many awards, including CNBC Samsung Award 2012. We are hitting a target of about 1 million units production by next year, and we are raising funds for the same. Our goal is to make Axios State available in every first aid kit in the country and to bring down the mortality and morbidity due to bleeding to a bare minimum. So, Axiostad is one's first step towards that. And we are into the business of saving lives. Thank you. Oh, well, 15 seconds ahead of time as well. Right, so questions for Leo. Yeah. Sorry, we just need a mic to get, get, get a mic to you. So this currently How much does it cost was the question? Yeah, this is currently costing about 400 rupees which, uh, to give you a perspective, something which is being used for the US military, something different product but similar application, cost about $100. So that's kind of a perspective. It's a one-time use for one heavy bleeding application. Yes. We'll come to you next, sir. Where Ma'am, can I ask you to stand up? Thank you. Where is this manufactured and what is your expectation to grow this to how much in the next three years? And what kind of business are you doing in this? Yeah, so currently we are manufacturing in Ahmedabad, Gujarat. We are scaling up our operations to hit about 1 million units in next two years. And we are looking at a target market about 5 million units in the next five years. So we are scaling up our operations for that. We are looking for the next series B funds for the same. Do you own the patents for the material itself? 
No, it's the material is natural biomaterial. No, there's no patent on the material which can be extracted. Okay. We have our own indigenous process by which we purify and make it into a form. And this is 100% natural material can be applied from any sites. We have so if a Johnson & Johnson were to manufacture this uh, by the million and price it below you, will they drive you out of business? So we, uh, they won't because we are already partnering with a larger, much larger firm. Uh, in the coming months it will be announced for a pan-India launch. Okay. So, yeah. right, so you have that angle covered. Yes, you had a question, sir. Two questions here. Can we get a mic? Increase the quantity, you will be able to reduce the price, uh, cost by a large margin. Yeah, I mean, like 400. Can it come to 100? Our target is to bring it down to between 50 to 100, so that it can be affordable for a larger mass across the country, just so that everyone can carry this in their first aid kit. So, thank you. Right. Go ahead, sir. So I'll just come to you next. Uh, would you imagine that this is majorly an urban-centric product? No. In urban India, uh, the time to reach a medical facility or reach an ambulance if you're in an accident is about 20 minutes. In, in states like Gujarat, it's about eight minutes. But in rural India, the time to reach nearest, nearest clinic is about one hour. So that's called the golden hour to survive or save a patient. You know, if you don't have anything with you to control bleeding, you'll be using your normal clothes, trying to control it, it won't control. So, I think the impact will be larger in rural. rural. Yeah, the, a question related to that. Do you expect a villager to understand what to do with this? No. So we are trying to send this through. The first, first set of target segment is paramedics, ambulances, and the NH, NRHM funds, which is being routed through the PHCs. So there'll be a paramedic operating it. Over a period, we expect this to be more user-friendly in the way to use it, so that anyone can just take it out and you know even just peel it out, take it off, and stuff it in. So. Okay, final question. We have to move on to the next contestant. Otherwise, our remaining contestants won't get time. Make it snappy, sir. Hello. Yeah, since I have the same background of biopharmaceutical... Can I request you to speak into the mic? Yeah. And uh, even since I have the background of biopharmaceutical, I patent the product for the diabetic wound dealing for Ranbaxi. I'm having a simple question that uh, how you compare your product with the collagen sheets, which are considered to be more efficacious as well as very cheap, cost-effective to the patients so far, till date. Yeah. What is the superiority in the, comp I mean, the principle as well as the cost? Very good question. Collagen, gelatin, oxidized cellulose, these are all surgical hemostats. They can only, they are only capable of controlling oozing which is minor, minor bleed. They absorb, they don't adhere. Our technology is based on adhesion. It's not absorption. So it works on a much larger wound. So you, put a, you take a collagen sheet and put it on a, an external wound, it will just get saturated with blood. It won't, it won't stay over there and seal it. In this case, it will create an adhesive layer which will stop the vessel from bleeding out. So that's why collagens are not seen as an external hemostat. It's for surgical use. All right, thank you. Thank you, Leo. I'm sorry I have to cut you off. Thank you. Thank you. Next finalist <coughs> is called the Banka Biolu. Devle they've developed a unique bio toilet that allows for end to end human waste management. The team from Banka Biolu. Quite a funky name, Banka Biolu. When you're ready, your time starts. Good afternoon, everybody. 60% of our country folks don't have access to basic sanitation. 300 out of 5,000 urban areas have only a partial sewage system and only 15% of the sewage generated is treated. Banka Biolu applies patented DRDO biotechnology for treatment of waste with the help of inoculated bacteria, we call them biobugs, that degrade and converts the human waste into reusable water without the use of energy and any maintenance. We built toilets with a special tank, bio tank, with, with, with minimum space availability. It allows the use of affluent water for gardening and helps in recharging of the groundwater without any contamination. Additionally, the application of the technology is very flexible. It can be used to replace a septic tank or fit under a bottom rail carriage. And it can also be used in densely populated urban slums and rural areas. Since the introduction of bio toilets in 2012, we have completed 10 projects, about 100 toilets, impacting over 1,000 beneficiaries. We have backed competitive contracts from railway and government, 
and are the only company having a successful running contract for special maintenance and operation of toilets and railways. The time's As, up. You get 20 seconds okay. more. A successful project has influenced government to launch a 400 crore bio, 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 bio toilet project. We are now looking to scale up and to take up new sanitation projects. Our vision is to provide sanitation solution for all. Life and one for all. A special focus is on marginalized community now. We welcome you to join our journey. Thank you. All right, thank you. Right, questions for Banka Bayolu. So what is this super magic bug that you discovered or invented? How does it do all these magical things? This, this technology has been patented by Defense Research Development Organization. Okay. They have been doing this since last 25 years for their army people in Shiachen and Leh. But fortunately in 2005, they found a use in railways and mo moving toilets, mo uh, mobile applications. And I took it up last year, 2012, and started commercializing this technology in other areas as well, like in the septic tank application, then in the rural areas, construction of toilets, instead of just a normal septic uh, cesspit, we are trying to install bio toilets, which doesn't harm the groundwater table. So that and the reuse of, uh, reuse of water is a big uh, opportunity for us for the next uh, scaling this up. this bug has no other environmental impact? There's no, no absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay. Um, one uh, question over here. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had looked into technologies um, in the same area that allow you to produce combustible gas from this, uh, from this bio waste as well as fertilizer production for farming. Uh, the the bacteria which we add actually we are uh, it's like a fertilizer itself, but the res there is no residue coming out of this toilet, so the water which is coming out has a very high nutrient content. So we are using this water. We are encouraging uh, the owners of the house to use this water for gardening right now, and when in the rural area we are uh, we are installing these toilets, we are encouraging them to use it for their vegetable garden or for the agriculture purpose because there itself the water is a uh, very very a scarce issue and but uh, right now there is no composite is being formed in these toilets sorry not mine i don't know whose that is but any other questions yeah we had a hand up there can i request you to stand up so i'll come to you next sir sorry what is the maintenance cost in a normal toilet it's a one time investment uh, in, a, in a standalone unit, if the f family takes care of the toilet as a normal toilet without using too much of uh, uh, waste uh, like uh, acids and all, you don't require any maintenance as such. It's a maintenance friendly toilets. Yes. Yeah, I'll come to you next. So if you install these toilets in rural communities, uh, do you plan to redefine the phrase call of nature? I didn't get you, sir. Sorry, didn't get your question. If you install these toilets in rural communities in the households, do you plan to redefine the phrase, call of nature? The call of nature, quite literally, yes. Uh, the lady there, can we get a mic to her? Can you pass on your mic to her? Here, in the center aisle. Hi. Um, I know uh, you spoke about water uh, being reused, especially the one that's treated. Um, how receptive are people uh, to that idea? Because I personally, maybe it sounds bad, I knew that the water they're reusing is coming from a toilet and I'm eating that, I would think, what is happening here? <laughs> Most of the water which you get is of that quality. <laughs> anyway, but to start with. <laughs> Fair enough. So you don't know about it, that's why, but, uh, but uh, to give you an example, I have installed this kind of a thing in Senikpuri in Hyderabad, which has uh, been, uh, that family is really very happy with that because they are not feeling guilty of reusing extra water, this is what they tell me. So they are using the water completely for gardening and the vegetable garden. So it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful to use that water, it's, there's nothing that is, uh, it's, it doesn't smell either. So. <laughs> right. What's the you, installation you cost Sorry. and uh, any subsidy by government, any attempts by you to reach uh, Mr. Raj? Uh, have you got any subsidies from the government? No, uh, I, I don't Are have any subsidy for? from the government right now. Are you looking for any? I am no. actually an SME, so I get other kind of subsidies, so right. that's one I can get. 
All right. It all set to revolutionize the world of sanitation. It, uh, I, I would India. like to make one uh, small uh, uh, this thing here. Actually, I have worked this. Uh, I didn't know about this technology two years back, and when I worked with the, this technology for the last two years. I, I strongly feel once this actually gets established in another two, three years, it will revolutionize the world actually in the septic tank concept. This is a, not a one-time technology. It has been 25 years and uh, DRDO has been using it. But only thing is we need to apply it in a better way and uh, need to see how we have to scale up. But this is going to change septic tank concept. Definitely, right. definitely. No, All right, thank you. You didn't mention thank about you. installation cost. I'm sorry, sir. We'll have to cut it off. Cost. We'll have to tackle that separately, but you can answer that question. Okay. Uh, installation cost, I will, I will not be able to state here because it is totally customized. So we have a range from 15,000 to 7 lakhs. So anything it can be. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Sorry for rushing you. Our next finalist is the ERC Eye Care Center. They've developed a hub and spoke model for affordable primary medical eye care services. So go ahead. You need some innovative <laughs> laptop holding practices there. Yeah, done. Managed? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, your time starts now. So many of... Uh, You'll have to speak at the mic, sorry. Okay. Many, ladies and gentlemen, many of you are wearing glasses and consider them critical for everyday life. While we are fortunate enough to get a glass as and when we want, rural India is not so fortunate. Traveling several kilometers, losing a day's work, and sometimes not affording a glass at all. For the rural weaver, craftsman, the tailor, the barber, or simply the mother who wants to help her children read, this may mean putting their already meager livelihoods at stake. With 85% of Northeast India living in the villages, the problem assumes gigantic proportions. At ERC, we address that need of accessibility with our rural vision centers spread across the districts connected to a city hub. And with $1 consultations, $4 glasses, and cataract surgeries starting at $60, we make it affordable too. In our efforts to connect to the communities we serve, we re recruit ERC vision assistants who are local village women trained to collect data, refer patients, and spread awareness in the villages. We are a team constituting of myself, an ophthalmologist, a communicator from Europe, two advisors from IIMs who advise us on business strategy, 11 employees and 48 EVAs. <laughs> Having served more than 7,000 people... Time is officially up, but you can finish what you're saying. Yeah. So in our efforts to connect to the communities we serve, we recruit e ERC vision assistants who are local village women trained to collect data and spread awareness in the villages. We are a team, as I told, already said, so having served more than 7,000 people since June 2011, we are gearing up for more action and aiming to reach over 30,000 people in 2013. At ERC, we dream of a world where the poor can avail the same services as the rich. We not only help people restore vision, but help them realize their potential. Thank you. All right. Stay there. There might be some questions for you. Can I request you to stay there? Yes. Questions for ERC Eye Care. Yes, gentlemen in the first row. Can you be in front with the mic? It might be easier, yeah. Can we keep one mic in the front and one in the back? Yeah. Uh, you must be aware of Arvind Eye Hospital. Yeah. They actually even don't charge anything to poor. Yeah. And even bring them from villages in thousands and uh, millions. Yeah. Uh, how do you compare uh, your example with them? And that's yeah, a Arvind, ready Arv, yeah I, I got your question. So Arvind is doing great work in South India. So the, the, one of the biggest differences is that we are in northeastern part of India where nobody is. Secondly, we are a for-profit social enterprise and we are not interested in providing anything for free. We have a one dollar consultation. It's in our revenue model that one dollar is nothing. The main revenue comes from the surgical and the optical retail. But we take it because we, tr we are trying to be accountable to, with all the services we provide. 
provide the patients with dignity of paying even if it's 50 rupees so that they feel we have paid something we can ask you questions it's not like free service i have worked with lions eye hospital with the government hospitals i have seen the kind of treatment doctors are, and other staff are giving to the patients just you are free you can don't ask us any questions no 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 guarantees on any quality at erc you are paying 50 you can ask us oh doctor i am not seeing properly what is this because you paid right good point good answer sorry somebody from the back without a mic i just heard a voice somebody else had a question yes so uh, how you have been able to bring down the costs you said 60 dollars per cataract surgery compared to others a cataract surgery uh, if you do a manual small incision cataract surgery that cost 1000 rupees so the similar surgery done in a private setup they charge 10000 rupees in a government setup they charge nothing but the npcb national program for control of blindness provides that 1000 rupees to the unit the ngo doing that thing so basically we we can we, we follow a, I, I want to add here that we follow a hcd approach that is here create and deliver so we have just fixed it at 3500 but we are new if we see that the utilization ratio for cataract surgery is less than that less than expected that we might even decrease it to 2000 rupees and still be profitable all right thank you thank you dr ube thank you your laptop is there right our next finalist is pharma secure they've developed technology to prevent pharma companies and from from counterfeits they've created software for unique psid code generation and its authentication so prevents counterfeiting so pharma secure Thank you very much. Your time starts when you start talking. Okay. All right, I've time started starts. talking. I have to take this medicine every day, and my life depends on it. I bought it at a pharmacy in India. I don't know if it's real. I don't know if it's fake. No one knows the exact percentages, but somewhere in the single or double digit percentages of the medicines in emerging it's markets are fake. <laughs> this is a medicine that has a unique number on it. Okay. So I'll call I can call in or send this number by text message and I'll get a response confirming my medicine is authentic. PharmaSecure, the company that myself, Nathan Sigworth, uh, and my college roommate started uh, six years ago, we print these unique numbers on the packages of drugs. We've done half a billion medicines in India uh, so far uh, this year. And uh, it's quite exciting because we're empowering patients to actually take control and know that the medicines they buy are real and not fake. Um, we're expanding. India is the country that produces medicines that go to many different countries. We're expanding to many of the Indian export markets for medicines. And it's not just about authentic medicine. Once you communicate the authenticity of a medicine, you can communicate so many other things. We can give patients information on how to take their medicine, how to treat their disease. And we work with many entrepreneurs in healthcare who've developed really cool tools for treating specific diseases uh, to help bring those tools to the mobile phones of the patients who are dealing with those diseases. That's it. All right. <laughs> Questions? Questions for Pharma Secure? Right. Gentlemen in the front rows. How does your organization validate the authenticity of the medicine? We install either labels or directly print um, a unique random number on the production line exactly where the product was produced. Um, and then when the consumer registers that unique identifier, uh, so we control the very beginning and the very end. And we work with established companies that have uh, good manufacturing. I'll just come to you. There was a hand ba up there in the back. No? Yes, the lady in the back. Can you give the lady in the yellow dress? Yeah, you can pass the next uh, mic here. How, how do you uh, protect yourself from counterfeits? I mean, anyone can, you know, if I have to pr produce fake medicines, I can even find a way of putting those numbers to get it validated. And what is the business model? Like, who pays you and uh, how do you make money? Sure. Um, we, we use a, a nine-digit alphanumeric code that's unique among trillions and trillions of, um, of products. And so you not only have to hit on one of the codes that is printed on a drug, but it has to match up with that particular drug 
and that particular batch information. I'd be happy to talk about some of our, we also have some smart analytical tools. The second part of the question was who pays you though? The pharmaceutical companies pay us to put the service. If, if, if a consumer is going to buy this medicine or this medicine, which would the consumer prefer? Is it more efficient for you to do this than the pharma company to do this themselves? We do this service for many different pharmaceutical companies right, in so India. Therefore you have and uh, so we're able to have scale. those economies of scale and price. Right. Question from no, the front. Actually, there's a continuity from where she stopped. In like, how many times can you check one authentication? How many SMSs do you entertain? Sure. Um, it's one-time use. After someone's verified a medicine, we have an alert in our system that this is something that's been verified. Is, is the code uh, unique to a particular strip or to the entire medicine? Like Every cross? single strip has a unique identifier. Right, we need to wrap up. We Just have one last question. follow up question. Yep. Uh, you didn't answer the question on prices. Who pays how much and on what basis? How much does it increase the price of the medicine by? Sure. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies pay a small amount per package. We do hundreds of millions of packages. So for the consumer, it's really just a tiny fraction and of a decimal, A decimal increase? Just a, a very small. Uh, one last question. Right, Sorry. we have too many last Here. questions. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so how many people are aware of it? Like I buy medicines, but I didn't know about it. So how many people Good are aware? Question. Do, do these companies like tell people that you can actually access this stuff? So. Sure. Um, even with 500 million packages, that's only 5% of the market in India. We're waiting to get onto more packages before we do a lot of uh, public awareness. We're working with our clients to time that public awareness at the right time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next contestant is Kalungo Institute of Diabetes Specialities. Can we have them on stage, please? Hi. Whenever you're ready, sir. Go ahead. I'm Dr. Alok Kanungo. I'm a diabetologist. 45-year-old Mr. Parija, father of two daughters, was brought to our hospital, kids hospital at Bhuvaneswar, Odisha, for his right leg amputation because he was suffering from bad diabetic foot ulcers. Our team worked very hard and we saved his leg. He is walking now. He could support, he could retain his job and support his family. This is the story of millions of Indians who suffer from complications of diabetes due to delayed diagnosis and inadequate treatment. And in India, there are 63 million diabetics and 15% 15, 15 of them have some complication or other which are preventable. While doing cutting edge research at Sweden, I could realize that diabetes is not a blood sugar disease alone. It affects all these vital systems of the body. And therefore, the treatment of diabetes should have a multidisciplinary approach. Thereby, KIDS or Kanungo Institute is a multi-speciality diabetes hospital and we see around 8 to 10,000 patients every month, out of which we detect around 1,000 complicated patients whom we treat. Thereby, these patients save around 5 to 10 lakh rupees down the road from getting advanced treatment and that changes their life. We are very close to raise around 3 million dollars of equity from Sidvi Venture Capital and to create multiple centers, district centers at uh, primary and secondary stages and thereby reaching around 4 million people of diabetics in Odisha and in 5 years time we are going to reach 5 different adjacent st states to uh, serve around 11 million people and to prevent 1 million complications every year. Thank you. Right, excellent. So in the earlier debate we had this question about how do you measure the value of a life saved. So you put some metrics to how much money I'd actually spent if I didn't get diagnosed at one of your clinics or if I didn't get diagnosed yes. for diabetes. Right. Any diabetics in this audience? It's uh, reported that one in eight Indians suffers diabetics. Anybody here? Diabetes, borderline? Yes, what an extraordinarily healthy room. Right. Anybody with diabetes, if you have questions for him based on your experience and if you don't have, if you have questions for him anyway. You had your hand up, sir? Did you have your hand up? No. Anybody else? Yes. Can we get a mic there? So how are you a social or a inclusive business and how are you different from a normal private hospital? Good also question. considering the fact that diabetes is generally in India at least seen as a urban or, or, a, or a middle class disease and not so much as a rural healthcare issue. 
this concept has changed. In 1990, we did a survey in rural Odisha through ICMR and the incidence was 0.8 percent. And state government has done a recent survey where the rural population is suffering 7.5 percent of them and urban is 15.5 percent. It is just increasing because economy is improving and the science is when a very, very poor man becomes poor, his chance of developing diabetes increases because affluence brings diabetes and India is gradually becoming, at least they are able to get their food regularly and if you get regular food, chance of diabetes increases. So, so prob probably that is the theory now and more of more rural people are getting affected and there is no solution for them. There is no dedicated diabetes hospital. Diabetes yeah. patient is a lifetime patient. You have to focus on him and his children also because he, he may go back but he lives behind the disease for his children. It is a genetic disorder. So this needs a social uh, understanding only not by banking alone. So we have to create such situation and we are creating a three-tier system, a multi-specialty hospital called KIDS, then district level centers and we are creating 8,000 village workers who are oriented towards diabetes care and they will help the community people on every level. Does it answer your question, both questions, but how you are different and whether diabetes is an urban phenomenon? And the other hospitals that uh, you mention, they are focused on multi-speciality, but they are not focused on diabetes care as it is at it should be. So we do not have a bigger competition. The lady in the... Why would you focus on creating different hospitals just for diabetes rather than providing training for people in regular hospitals to care for diabetes? Regular hospitals cannot take care of diabetes because uh, that is the experience and in Odisha there are only 20 diabetologists but requirement is 2 crore consultations. So we are now setting up the National College of Diabetology to train manpower to be oriented on diabetes management. It is a different type of management which not only needs science, it also needs some other passion. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Right, that brings us to our next category. This is called the special category and our first finalist in the special category is called InVenture. They built a technology that allows individuals in the informal sector to perform daily accounting through simple, through simple feed phones, feature phone using SMS or voice technology. So accounting using SMS or voice technology. InVenture, you're on. Good afternoon. There are 4.5 billion people worldwide who lack a financial identity. What this means is that they are unable to demonstrate their creditworthiness. Insight addresses this informal market through SMS and voice technology, allowing individuals to input their daily income and expenses. We then take this user's cash flow and demographic information and apply an individualized algorithm to generate a credit score. We also send regular statements back to users giving them the ability to access their digital financial record at any time. Take, for example, store owner Vijaya Lakshmi. Lakshmi has been able to receive a 10,000 rupee loan from a bank that is now accepting our credit scores. With this loan, she is now able to buy inventory in bulk, achieve a 35% increase in sales, and reinvest 1,000 rupees per month back into her business. She is now a credible consumer with a strong repayment ability in the eyes of lending institutions. But there's more. Lakshmi recently told me that this is the first time in her life that she is able to know how much she's making and spending every week. Moreover, she's actually changing how she spent as a result of it. So what we've created now then is a daily life accounting tool. Our scores are 98% accurate using these alternative forms of data, data that we believe allows us to be more fair and transparent in how we score and understand the unbanked and offline world. Through this process, we are helping individuals like Vijaya Lakshmi not only to create their financial history, but also to imagine greater financial future possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for InVenture? Yes. Can we uh, first hear them? Yeah. Give them the mic as well. We'll do that next. Hello. Yeah. How do you make sure that the data they enter is genuine? Sure. So we, um, 
We ha have a back end that triggers alarms if suspicious or inconsistent entries are logged, and we also perform random monthly audits on 5% of that sample size. And we look at a variety of information. Um, we adjust for culture, geography, climate, meteorology, infrastructure, education, epidemiology, sanitation. So we have a lot of really good consistent data to work with and to verify against. If it's at no cost to the user, the SMS or the voice technology, how do you make money? So our business model is based off of lending institutions. Um, they pay us. They use us as a portfolio service. They leverage our data collection for risk mitigation, um, for due diligence, and improved visibility into their lending performance. So they have reduced costs, lower defaults, um, and increased margins. And we do lead generation, credit score fees, as well as um, licensing fees for analytics and technology. Anybody else? Yes. Gentleman there. Yeah. Mike will come to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I just wanted to know what is the cost that you're charging for providing this credit score and how are you planning to bring this cost down in future? Sure. Um, that's a great question. I can talk to you afterwards and we can, I can put you in touch with someone who can answer those questions. Right. <laughs> Gentleman in the back. Okay. Uh, most of the lending institution in India are uh, taking um, stated income uh, for uh, evaluating poor and uh, funding them. So uh, how does you know, how you plan to penetrate that market because uh, it is called, you know, uh, MFI in such a situation that uh, they uh, cannot afford, uh, you know, to increase their cost. So your question is how are we, how do we differentiate ourselves from existing MFIs? How, why can't they just incorporate this into their business model? Is that, also I don't More know where you are. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so we provide, what we believe we differentiate is that we provide um, a platform that uses specific user information. Um, and so we have real-time data that is analyzed and we believe that this technology is very proprietary and um, the banks cannot necessarily implement this as efficiently. All right, thank you. Thank you, Inventure. Thank you. Our next finalist is called Rural Shows. They, sets up, they set up and manage rural BPOs to provide employment to youth, especially women groups in villages in Karnataka. So it's Rural Shows. Good afternoon. I am an outlier because I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm just representing this company. I hope that's okay. Indian cities are growing at a fast pace of 4% and slums at an even faster pace of 5%. This is predominantly because rural India does not have, rural Indian youth do not get enough job opportunities. We at Rural Shores therefore believe that the next big wave is rural shoring after offshoring. We are a rural focused socio-commercial initiative dedicated to create employment in villages in India by assimilating the strong rural youth force into knowledge economy. We do so by tapping into the process outsourcing opportunities in the field of IT-enabled services and business enablement services. Rural Shores is a proven model. We currently have 1,600 employees working in 15 centers across 10 states, and we process over 40 processes for over two dozen blue chip clients. We offer our clients a game-changing value proposition to support their operational transformation efforts. We offer cost savings and committed service levels through a talented and dedicated workforce. In addition, we provide non-replicable access to rural markets, which is critical for companies that are looking for growth in India's heartland. Our objective is to establish one rural show center in each of the 500 rural districts of India, and hence provide sustainable employment to over 100,000 rural youth in the next 10 years. And 50% of our employees are women. Thank you. Right. So would you like to field questions on behalf of the company, do you think? Of course. If I can answer them, I'll be happy to answer Certainly. them. Certainly. Okay. Questions for rural shores? Anybody? I have one. What differentiates you from every other BPO in the business? Uh, A is uh, we are tapping the rural talent, which is hitherto untapped. We are trying to stop the migration that happens to uh, the cities. And uh, there was a belief that the, the rural youth cannot deliver up to the mark as per their urban counterparts. So we are trying to counter that. 
We've been doing processes for blue chip clients, expecting and delivering the same service standards. So okay. there's no compromise on quality or service levels. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next business is called Saki Unique Rural Enterprises. It empowers women and rural communities by providing them with livelihood opportunities such as distribution and selling agenda for clean energy products. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, myself, Upmanyu Patil. I am representing an organization called Saki Unique Rural Enterprise. We have a rural distribution and marketing company who works with 800 plus rural women entrepreneurs who market the clean energy products. Lack of uh, opportunities for women in rural India as well as the uh, solutions like uh, smokeless cook stoves, uh, solar lanterns or clean energy solutions are no <coughs> not easily accessible in the rural uh, areas. So we are trying to address these both issues by uh, forming a <coughs> distribution company uh, which engage women entrepreneurs to market the uh, clean energy solutions. Till date, we have sold around 70,000 of cook stoves and more than 25,000 of solar lanterns and water purifiers and so on. Uh, we are also uh, establishing the micro businesses for these rural uh, women entrepreneurs in the area of clean, and, uh, clean water, uh, pure water and also the fuel which is based on uh, agro waste. In uh, <coughs> next three years, we want to create another 1,000 women entrepreneurs to reach out 200,000 households in the state of Maharashtra and Bihar. Uh, we are looking for more product partners who are in the clean energy space and also the investors to scale up similar initiative. Thank you. All right. Bang on time as well. Questions for Saki Unique Rural Enterprises? Anybody grilling them? Okay. The lady in green, can we request you to stand up, ma'am? Yeah, hi. Yep. Um, asking people in rural India to switch from traditional methods of cooking to clean stoves requires them to not only overcome an economic barrier, but also a fairly large behavioral shift. Can you talk about how your company is dealing with these challenges? Good question. So, we have created a number of distributors and sales executives in different parts of the country. They go through the villages, make a baseline survey, adopt the willingness of the users that whether they are ready to buy the stove after knowing all the impacts and the benefits of the stove. When we gather the, collect the, collect the willingness, then deploy them the cook stove. There are many users which are ready to buy these cook stoves just for saving their money. Are there any people who are saying, Maza nahi aata hai to cook in this? Is there any cultural feedback you're getting saying that? Somehow food if I will burn, if, if I will burn it here, nobody, nobody can say maza nahi aata hai. It will just look like LPG. You cannot, cannot differentiate whether it is LPG or it is a rice husk stove. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The final finalist in this special category is Project Dharma. They create sustainable livelihoods by recruiting underprivileged youth and women who go door to door to sell socially relevant products to rural communities. So Project Dharma. Good afternoon. 70% of the Indian population lives in villages and only about 10% have a regular source of income. In the same areas, people are dying from preventable issues such as indoor air pollution, undernutrition, lack of safe drinking water and sanitation. We at Dharma believe entrepreneurship will emerge as the most powerful route to economic, social and living standard upliftment at the base of the pyramid. Dharma recruits, trains and mentors entrepreneurs to provide their communities access to basic amenities such as clean energy, clean cooking solutions, safe drinking water and a balanced diet. We give these entrepreneurs access to best-in-class business support such as an SAP-enabled IT infrastructure, supply chain, training, <coughs> and other things which help them maximize the ROI. They then become agents of change in their own communities. We have a network of more than 2,500 enterprises so far, reaching more than 1 million people in four states across 24 districts. This has been made possible by a team that has a collective experience of more than 50 years in empowering women entrepreneurs rural last mile distribution, private equity, and the NGO space. Until 2020, we aim to empower more than 100,000 entrepreneurs, which will help us improving lives of more than 50 million people. 
I'm Gaurav Mehta, one of the founders of Dharma, and would like to invite you to join our team on this journey of social change. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Project Dharma? Sorry, we're just going to interrupt it for a second. We need a quick housekeeping announcement before we, we get your Q&A. But don't go anywhere. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry to disrupt the flow of the session. I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, we are going to begin with the session on aligning donors' agenda, initiating a value chain, of chain approach in the room, Pawai Ballroom 2. Right now, I would request representatives of philanthropic foundations, family institutions, and private on, uh, uh, in foundations to please join us in the room and participate in the discussion. Thank you so much. Okay. Right, so are you like a sort of rural, socially relevant Amway? Well, uh, yes, to some extent we're using methods of Amway, but we're trying to obviously put some incentives against uh, misuse of these methods. Okay. So we have an absolute money-back guarantee. So if someone oversells, we take it back and we check that. What if your consumers don't want socially relevant products? What if they want socially irrelevant products, such as, I don't know, video games? So we differentiate between social issues first and lifestyle, but we will not go into social negative. So we're creating, we're creating a framework with different foundations and organizations to find a limit as long and as how do you define what a socially relevant product or service is so there's obviously products which have an obvious social uh, impact there's products which are socially neutral we believe in choice so we don't want to limit them if the entrepreneur maximizes income by selling i mean something which is not considered negative and i would put let's say any um, you know alcohol tobacco any of those are very easy ones it's very Sorry, difficult we can't hear you what is what is an example of a socially neutral product a socially neutral product would be, and uh, let's say something for children, if okay. which fosters education. So toys could be something like that. Right. Very simple, but yes, yes. Go ahead. Mike here, please. Yeah, a couple of questions. So, what's your geographic presence right now, uh, and? What is, uh, how, how do you sort of propose to overcome the challenge of scale or is scale something that you're looking at right now? And my second question is, do you notice certain behavior with respect to your, with respect to your entrepreneurs that uh, if they have a basket of products, if there's a particular product on which they have a better margin, then, then that's the product that's probably being pushed more. A commission you know, bias. So, so you, how do you incentivize them to make sure that the basket remains balanced and it's not just one product that's going out? So, great question. So, first of all, I mean, we are now in four states and we've in 24 districts. So, we are absolutely looking at scale. We're trying to move to six states by end of the year. And we're doing that by, you know, replicating some of the processes and standardizing them. And uh, we're absolutely looking at scaling up. The second question on incentives is absolutely valid. I mean, what happens is, um, you know, we're trying to take each cause one at a time and create incentives which are um, also recognition based for causes where the margin is lower. Alternatively, if there's foundations which support those causes, we take marketing budgets and disalign the incentives just to make a better, bigger impact. So that it's very, very complex. It depends on each cause. Anybody else? Questions? Yes. Sorry, I didn't see your hand for a minute there. Thanks. It's on. Go ahead. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, Project Dharma is a very interesting name for your organization. And uh, what does Changemaker, what's the ideal Changemaker that you hope to create, um, given that you guys are called Project Dharma? So, uh, Dharma is not taken in a religious sense here. Dharma is taken in a sense of duty sense. So, we feel that anyone, I mean, it's anyone's duty to make that difference, if it's a social difference. So, it's taken in a spiritual sense, not in a religious sense. In terms of the ideal person, it could be, uh, both a you know woman or a man who has that who wants to make a difference it's not only the financial consideration we're looking at it's also the positive uh, societal change uh, component which has to be in that person so there has to be some sense of responsibility and desire to make a difference all right fair enough thank you thank you project dharma right, with this we have a 15 minute coffee break tea break we'll be back in this room in 15 minutes we are running a little late so i'll request all of you to come back in exactly 15 minutes. Thank you. We'll have three more categories when you come back. The coffee machines were really slow. So if you're in the market for inventing a faster coffee machine, I think you're going to have a ready market, at least at the Renaissance in Powai. 
With that, we come to our next set of finalists. The category is Clean Energy and Clean Technology. Our first finalist in this category is Avani Bioenergy. And here's what they do. They develop an innovative technology using needles and gasification systems to form producer's gas. Used an internal combustion engine to generate power. And to find out what producer's gas is, we have Avani Bioenergy. Go ahead, sir. Hello. My name is Rajneesh Jain. I'm founder of Avani Bioenergy. We are in the business of generating electricity and cooking charcoal from pine needles. Yes, the needle-shaped leaves of pine trees. Central Himalayas have large tracts of pine forests where excessive forest fires spread by pine needle litter during the dry summer months destroy natural resources. We employ rural families who are unemployed to collect these pine needles before they have had a chance to burn. And for what you might ask, to convert them into electricity and cooking charcoal, thereby restoring biodiversity, reducing carbon emission, and eventually driving rural economy, because that's what is always lacking in the rural areas. Uh, our innovation has a potential of generating 500 megawatts of electricity in Uttarakhand state alone. We are not even talking of the entire Himalayan region. We have set up, we have signed a 20-year power purchase agreement with Uttarakhand Power Corporation Limited to sell electricity from our 120 kilowatt power station. And we are looking for partners and investors to set up two and a half megawatts of electricity generation capacity, which will impact over a quarter million lives. Thank you. Right, Rajneesh, so the, the immediate question is, none of us are technology experts here. Could you just quickly describe for us what you do with the pine needles? Do you burn them and create heat energy and create a, run a turbine? Okay, well, it's a thermochemical process of converting them into combustible gases. What you do is you burn, it's a partially combustive process, but it's not completely combustive. And I don't know if people who have been to, who have been, who have been to chemistry classes, it's a oxidation and reduction process, you know, in turn. So, so you, you burn the pine needles? oxidize the biomass, okay. make carbon dioxide, and then you reduce it to carbon monoxide, which is a combustible gas. There are other sets of gases also, there are other set of gases also, which are all combustible gases like hydrogen, methane, and you run an engine on those gases. So you run an engine and that engine and generates then electricity? The alternator to generate Right, so the key gas. question would be what are the uh, byproducts of this process? Do you generate a lot of carbon so, dioxide? No, we don't generate any carbon dioxide. The only carbon dioxide that is generated is when you run the engine, which is a normal process. But the emission levels are much lower than any uh, diesel generators or let's say even the prescribed norms of the pollution control board. What we also get in the process, this is electricity. What we also get in the process, as I said, cooking charcoal. We get 10% of the pine needles as unburnt, completely unexhausted charcoal, which we are briquetting. And that is giving a cooking energy solution to these families. Okay. Charcoal. All right. Any questions for Rajneesh Jain? Understood? Didn't understand? Wondering how electricity is generated? Any questions? Right, Rajneesh, I have one more question. So your sure. business model is largely supplying to state electricity boards, or do you di directly supply to industrial or post retail consumers, for instance? Mm. So we could do both. The, uh, I don't know about all the states, but certainly in Uttarakhand, the renewable energy policy actually allows you to wheel power, which means actually you can find customers anywhere in the country and use the existing grid to, to bring power to them. And... Uh, as we all know, you know, due to global concerns for reducing carbon emissions, there is a huge market for that. And how does your energy Anybody compare with solar or any other renewable energy in terms of cost per unit? Uh, look, the most interesting fact about this here is that when we say 120 kilowatt installed capacity, it compares much better because we are generating 
more than three times the units of electricity because it's working 24 hours. It can work 24 hours a day, whereas solar is only going to produce during the day. Having said that, we are not in competition with solar okay. because, in, in fact, in a way we are complementing, our problem started from the other end of the challenge was how to check forest fires to restore biodiversity and we needed to give these pine needles an economic value. That's how we started. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Our next finalist is called Frontier Markets. Frontier Markets engages in, is a sales and service distribution company for clean energy products that replace kerosene to access reliable lighting in rural India. So Frontier Markets. Why are households continuously losing their children in kerosene fires? Why are people living in darkness? Why are people not understanding reliable access to lighting, even though solar solutions or clean energy solutions exist? This is something that I've been thinking about for over eight years while working in rural India. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ajeta Shah, and I'm the founder CEO of Frontier Markets. The problem is that while clean energy solutions exist, nobody is actually present to service these products or provide any sort of necessary guidance to actually help in supporting these products if they're damaged. When the product doesn't function anymore, people revert to kerosene, the deadly solution. Our field staff live in rural villages that we serve in. We have created a brand presence through our service centers called Saral Jivan. When Santosh purchased her first solar lantern, she was happily surprised by a call from Saro Jeevan's call center, and she learned about the ability of what solar is, how to best use it, and also understand that if there was a problem with the product, Frontier Markets and Saro Jeevan would be there to fix it. She grew to trust us, and therefore grew to trust solar. Today she comes to us with other needs that involve solar systems. For example, powering her charge machine. Her husband has become an entrepreneur or a Saro Jeevan Sayogi selling solar products in his panchayat. We have 10 field staff with 45 Sayogi serving 900 villages in Rajasthan and Andhra Pradesh, selling over 5,000 solar lanterns, home lighting solutions, and now testing inverters and solar pumps. We, with an additional funding, we're actually embedding a mobile technology solution that captures more information about these households, track product impact, and scale. In five years, we hope to be working in 600 service centers, selling 3.5 million products with 20,000 sayogis in five states of India. We believe we've created the platform to, re to require for sustainable delivery of products and services. Today, it's clean energy. Tomorrow, it's agriculture, water, and healthcare. Thank you. All right, questions for Frontier Markets? Anybody? I have one for you, Ajayta. So are you a platform company or are you a product company or are you both? We are a platform company. Okay. Uh, we aren't looking to produce any products. We're looking to deliver them and provide service around the actual product or service that's there. So it's a okay. platform to really engage the customers. And a product like a solar lantern, is it sold at market price? Is it subsidized? We don't believe in subsidi subsidizing the product. Um, all of our products are sold on market price. And kerosene, as you know, is a political commodity. And if the price of kerosene is going to be heavily subsidized and it's going to be much cheaper to run kerosene lamps, albeit with some dangers, are you worried that the subsidy market will distort the market for your product? So that's actually, in fact, not true. Kerosene okay. is, even though it is being subsidized, is actually still very expensive. It's okay. also not accessible nor available and super dangerous. Okay. So we actually aren't worried about the competition that kerosene is creating, given the value proposition that solar has for our market. Okay. As India electrifies more and more, and we bring more and more cities and villages into grid, does it eventually mean that your market for solar products will vaporize? Uh, yes and no, but A, I don't believe rural electrification is going to happen anytime soon where our okay. market is going to be distorted. But secondly, what we've created is a platform for service. So even if there is access to electricity, our platform would be providing energy efficient goods and services that work around that. So it's an ecosystem for the okay. products. So energy efficiency. Any other questions? Yeah. Can we have the mic here again, please? Sorry, the mic's there. The people in the back are unusually silent. Yes, we'll come uh, to you next. What are the major challenges you look in your expansion? 
Uh, we, I think, I think every social entrepreneur says this, but HR. Um, so I think recruitment has definitely been a challenge for scale. Uh, whenever anyone thinks about last mile distribution, everyone thinks about the fear of it being, you know, a people-heavy model. But I've coming from a microfinance background, actually see us uh, reducing that people problem by embedding technology. Uh, technology as a way to do direct engagement with the household. So for example, when I use a phone call to actually check to see the performance of my field staff, I'm actually able to audit the performance of my, of my field staff th from my customer engagement. So there's certain types of technology integration that I think that can happen that helps us address that challenge. Uh, the lady in the back, yeah. yeah. So what are the acceptance levels of your product in the rural area? Like, uh, how do they accept it? Do they understand what clean energy is and how do you convince? Sure. Um, so I think it's been interesting. Um, in Rajasthan specifically, people know what solar is, but they've been very skeptical about the effectiveness of solar because there hasn't been service and maintenance on the ground. So we spent a lot of time actually building, rebuilding trust in solar because we were present or accountable for the sales that we created. So as we started building, so the, 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 the value proposition wasn't about the understanding of solar, it was about accepting that someone will be there to f to maintain that pro that product. So today, actually, because there's a massive demand for this, uh, it's been it's been uh, received quite well in our markets. Yes, one more question, right at the back, all the way in the back. Can we send the mic all the way to the back? Can you stand up, sir? So they know who you are. Yeah, that's the gentleman. Hello. Um, I'm not sure that uh, most people are aware that uh, Moore's law applied to technology implies that solar will be the cheapest electricity source by 2018. Have you factored this into your business plan? Yes. So one of, one of the things that we do very closely is we're constantly looking at new technologies, uh, new technology integration in solar, in biomass, in cook stoves. Because for us, it's, it, is, it is being able to provide the best highest quality and most affordable solutions. So constantly we're paying attention to what's coming out there in the market and that's definitely a big value proposition for us as we're looking to scale. Okay, thank you, Ajaysa, thank you. All right, our next finalist is called Green Power Systems and Green Power Systems has designed something called the Bio Urja, a waste to energy reactor that takes in bio waste to produce LPG. Oh, you're here, sorry, I didn't see you, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, so in the last one hour, I have heard so many numbers that, I mean, my, my, my uh, mind is buzzing. So I'll avoid that. I'll try to keep it qualitative. After all, any problem in India is big, and so is ours. And the problem, as uh, uh, we just heard, what we're trying to solve is that of the waste disaster that we're looking at. And how do we intend to do that? Using the bio urja, which is the most compact of its kind waste energy system anywhere in the world. It's a patent-pending product, uh, custom-built for an unsegregated ecosystem such as that of India, and we've already been recognized by a number of international platforms such as the MIT Technology Review, the Kaufman Foundation as a part of the Global Entrepreneurship Week and all. Now, just to give an idea, the waste problem in India is very city-centric. I mean, 25% uh, of the waste in the country comes from Delhi, Mumbai, and Kolkata alone, and there is no land around. The conventional technologies are not meant <coughs> for our cities. Uh, so giving, keeping this in mind, to give an idea, to give you an idea, if the Poe Corporation were to give us just this piece of land, you'd be able to handle the waste coming in, wet waste coming in from 10,000 households, and not just treat it scientifically, but produce 10,000 cylinders of LPG equivalent in a year. So, uh, so this is what we have on the plate. Uh, it's just been three months since we have started off with the commercialization, and we are already already handling 0.2 percent of Bangalore's wet waste. We are already working with organizations such as Akshay Patra and all. In the next three years, our idea is to handle uh, around 1,000 tons of waste uh, per, per day, uh, which would positively impact around a crore people. So, so yeah, so this has been our journey so far in a nutshell. Uh, and do follow our story at greenpowersystems.co.in. I repeat, greenpowersystems.co.in. Right. That's a very fast presentation. Right. Questions for Green Power Systems? Surely, some questions. Are you fascinated to know how bio waste becomes LPG? It's LPG equivalent. Actually. LPG equivalent. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, what yeah, happens. Yeah, so basically, I mean, uh, it's it's uh, it's a.
Saying, what would you, would you be doing 10 years from now? So there's no dearth of waste, that's a good part. So, we are, so there's no dearth of the input and nothing is happening with it. Because again, as we have heard from many other pitches, I mean, anything which is free, I mean, no one cares about it. So our idea is to put a price to it and we are talking of model, I mean, we are talking of project financing model. So, I mean, uh, if you look at the IRR of our projects now, uh, so it's beyond 30%. So we are talking of a model where we intend to rate loans at market rate. So the money which is easily and very uh, available very fast. So we don't want that to be a bottleneck. So eventually, I mean, our scalability will, the way I look at it is, it will depend on our investment appetite. So as long as, yeah, we are, uh, we run our plans well, I think, I mean, we should be uh, taking a lot of waste and generating, generating a lot of clean energy. And your competitor would be commercially available LPG? Uh, uh, so, uh, so, yeah, in a way, yeah. And what if that became cheaper due to more gas fines? What uh, is it due to your it, business it's, it's model? It's very expensive. Just to give an idea, commercial LPG today, I mean, in Maharashtra, I mean, a, a cylinder costs uh, 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 more than 2,000 bucks. So per kg, it costs more than 100 rupees. In our case, our cost of producing that, it, it's already in the range of around 30 to 35 rupees. And as we grow, we, we, we you can bring it down. to be much more efficient. And in terms of calorific value and it's Yeah, heat. so that's why, that's why I'm using the term LPG equivalent. It's methane. So we, we bring down the, uh, as a, based on the calorific value, because I mean, people understand LPG, so hence we use the term LPG, LPG equivalent. equivalent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on, our next finalist is called Claro Energy. They're manufacturers of an innovative solar-based water pumping solution in power deficit rural regions that can be monitored and controlled remotely, excitingly enough, via computers and cell phones. So Claro Energy, all yours. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, in 2010, when I moved back uh, from the US to India, I got a chance to travel to Bihar for the first time in my life. And trust me, I had, you know, all kinds of stereotypes that one could possibly have about Bihar. Uh, but the objective of that visit was to interact with farmers who were practicing agriculture, which for most past was uh, subsistence agriculture in Bihar, and to understand what were their cost inputs looking like. And you were quite startled to find that uh, agriculture was quickly losing flavor uh, as a profitable economic activity. And uh, the largest reason for that was uh, the high cost of diesel-based irrigation in a very power deficit uh, state like Bihar. So we said, interesting proposition, you know, let's try to address this problem. And uh, we came up with a solar water pumping solution which allows us to uh, power up any pump from, say, as small as one horsepower all the way to up 80 horsepower uh, using this uh, intelligent controller. And we can remotely operate it using cell phones or, 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 or any computer connected to the internet. So in the two years that we've uh, been uh, at Claro Energy, we've installed about uh, a little over 100 uh, installations, uh, mostly across Bihar for now. Uh, in the process, we've impacted about 10,000 lives and uh, clogged top line of, cumulative top line of about seven crores. Uh, going forward, we're looking for partners who can help us uh, scale this to about 2,500 installations over the next two years. Uh, and our revenue targets for next year are about uh, 25 crores. We're a profitable venture. Uh, doing very well for ourselves. So uh, this is more about creating channels uh, for customer acquisition and for service networks uh, in the states of Bihar and Jharkhand. Thank you. Right. Once again, you know the drill. Questions? Anybody? Yes. Go ahead, sir. Once we'll just get your mic. I can't see the mics here. Front row. In India, uh, so many people are trying to replace with solar energy. When come to the agriculture uh, pump set, uh, almost uh, to run a three uh, to replace a three HP motor, it requires uh, 1.5 lakh almost, I think, per uh, uh, solar system pumping system motor. So, how can you uh, economize this cost? What are your plans? See, interestingly enough, and I could specifically talk about Bihar because we've done most of our work there. Uh, the payback periods on solar installations are actually sub three years if you just account for diesel, uh, diesel offset, which means the amount of money that you would save by not spending on diesel each year when you're using a solar pump will add up enough to pay for the system cost in less than three years. What we're not even accounting for uh, here is the fact that solar pumps now because cost of irrigation uh, is pretty much zero, allows you to do extra crops in a year, which means more additional income. Reliable irrigation means improved agricultural yields. So we currently have IFPRI doing a study on about 17 of our installations where they're trying to quantify the impact outside of diesel offset. And the numbers, when they add up, will actually bring down the payback period from three years to about 1.5 years. 
the question in this case is the farmer is, is a poor uh, consumer. I mean, he doesn't have the wherewithal to, you know, put up the upfront capex. So uh, to make this thing mainstream uh, uh, or, you know, large scale, we need to figure out the financial linkages and which, that is what we're working at right now in terms of tying up with banks such as Nabad and their affiliates. Uh, and also in terms of innovating on the business model. So, you know, what, one of the things we're trying to experiment with is a pay-as-you-go model wherein instead of uh, the customer taking an ownership or a farmer taking an ownership of the asset, we take the ownership of an asset and sell water as a service. So it's, this is going to be mostly around business model innovation and introducing financial engineering. Uh, there is tax benefits like 80% depreciation on solar pumps. You know, you could involve a corporate uh, like, say, an ITC, for instance, who has an exposure to agriculture in some shape or form who would be interested in that kind of benefit. So there's a lot of uh, innovation that can happen around that which will make these uh, systems more affordable for the end consumer. But I have a follow-up question to that. So if you're going to get so deeply involved in the financing of the pumps itself, won't you cease to be a solar energy company and become a de facto microfinance company or a financial services company? And second, will that distract from your management abilities to run a solar power company? I, I, I doubt if there is any rural company or a company which is operating in the rural domain which can isolate itself from the whole financing angle because that will continue to be the biggest uh, pain point in terms of addressing a broader spectrum of the market. So whether we like it or not, I think we'll have to, uh, we'll be forced to build those internal capabilities to address both challenges in parallel rather than focusing on just the technology bit or the Does finance. it make sense then for a group of rural entrepreneurs such as yourself to outsource all your financing needs to a third party who's also an entrepreneur in the same space? Yeah. No, it does, it does. But the point is, I think we still have a long way to go in terms of uh, figuring out, I mean, there's a lot of talk. I mean, we've, you know, we've all been talking about the same stuff over and over again for the last two years that I've been in the industry. Okay. And very little stuff has actually happened on the ground. I mean, there are mandates on uh, banks having an agricultural portfolio, agriculture being a priority language sector already. But you see very little stuff moving on the ground. So okay. I could leave it to a third party and wait but for them to figure But you're filling the gap because nobody else is. Exactly. All right. Any other? Yes, sir. Go ahead. We'll come to you next, sir. Hey, hi. Uh, so, like, uh, uh, so basically, just to understand, uh, I mean, you said like internet based and stuff. Can I request you, you to hold up the mic a little bit? Yeah, sorry. Uh, 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 so, you basically said that these pumps are activated through the internet and mobile technologies. How do you explain that to a farmer and how acceptable Good is Good question. It? Yeah, so that is not a service for the farmer as such, it's not a direct sell to him. Uh, the internet capability is actually for our own good because imagine a scenario of two years from now when we're talking about 3,000 assets that you would have deployed on the ground. Now, if something goes wrong with some asset, which is the pump is not delivering water for whatever reason, it could be a loose connection or a rusted wire or a short circuit or whatever, the farmer is going to call us and say that your pump is not working. Old school way would have been to send a service guy to the field to do the diagnosis and come back, go back with the tools and the spares and hopefully rectify the problem. A lot of costs involved, uh, a lot of uh, downtime uh, of the system. Uh, the remote monitoring capability allows us to do the diagnosis sitting uh, in, in our office in Patna, for instance. And uh, for most part, because of the troubleshooting training that we give when we install a system, we are able to address the problem over the phone. One trip we can essentially uh, take care of the issue. So the, the remote monitoring thing is not really a solution or rather a, uh, it's not a package that we sell to the farmer but it's only to bring down the cost of after sale support essentially. Right, one final question uh, from here before uh, we… Uh, are sorry, these uh, dual power use pumps? I mean if the say solar power is not available then can it can run switch on to regular pumps? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So essentially we're not, we're only changing the power source. So we're saying you bring your existing pump set we'll just change the power source from uh, uh, conventional AC or DG to uh, solar. In fact, the systems that we're offering actually have a provision for a three-phase AC input. So in case for whatever reason uh, the panels are not delivering the uh, output, the power, you can just plug in uh, AC power if at all it is available or a DC generator also. So one, one more quick question. What are the other applications you're looking at apart from the rural agricultural? So interesting applications are evolving because at the end of the day we're pumping water from point A to point B. So we're already in the drinking water vertical. We see a lot of traction coming from the drinking water purification segment, uh, wherein small kits uh, which essentially uh, are removing, you know, specific kinds of heavy metals from water which can, which need a pump to operate uh, can be run through the same solution. Other interesting applications are drinking water supplies in buildings, you know, every, build, every uh, you know, real estate building in say a Gurgaon or whatever needs to, or Bombay for in fact, for the fact, uh, needs to pump water from a reservoir on the ground level to uh, the top floors. So, interesting applications are evolving. I think as a startup, we're super excited because uh, there's more stuff to do than we, than we can handle right now. So, and that's where we're looking to, for partners to help us grow in right. those applications. All the best to you. Thank you. Right. With that, we move on to our next category.
The category is Education Vocational Training. Our first finalist in this category is ACE Experiences. And here's what ACE Experiences does. They build experimental learning tools managed and facilitated by the people with disabilities. Good evening. Let me start with a true life story. Rohit suddenly turned blind when he was 18 years of age. A very well educated and capable guy. After coming to terms with his new reality, started looking for a job to settle down in his life. In spite of doing quite well in most of the interviews, at the end of it, he was politely refused a job because he was blind. 87 million people in our country are disabled in some form or the other, out of which 7 million people, like Rohit, are educated and eligible for jobs. Sadly, only 4,000 people make it to jobs. That is not because they are eligible or capable, but because there is a government quota reservation system. The problem in our country is the society is not aware about the capabilities of the disabled people. The solution lies in sensitizing the world that the so-called disabled are not disabled, but differently able to people capable of delivering a service like any one of us in this room. Dialogue in the Dark precisely does this. Dialogue in the Dark is a very unique entertainment experience that happens in complete darkness. It's a guided tour, and the tour guides are blind people or visually impaired people. During the tour, visitors experience or come to understand the capabilities of the blind, which alters their mindsets and actually opens up opportunities for the disabled people. Till date, we've had more than 100,000 visitors coming to the Dialogue in the Dark exhibition tour and taking back a message on diversity and social inclusion. As we move to the future, we plan to expand across the country and sensitize at least 5 million people on a message of diversity and social inclusion and create at least 10,000 jobs for the differently abled community. Rohit's job search ended finally when Dialogue in the Dark opened in Hyderabad. My name is Krishnan and I'm very, very happy to present Dialogue in the Dark to this audience. Thanks. Thank you, Krishnan. And, and just to clarify, you also run a restaurant in Hyderabad that's completely oh, yeah. in darkness. The food is served in darkness. You pay in darkness. You eat in darkness. And that's supposed to be a fabulous money is, experience. Money is collected in light and food is cooked in light. Sorry? Money is collected in light. And the and food, food is, is cooked, cooked in, in light. light. Okay. Yeah. All the experiences for the consumer are in darkness. So this yes. is in Hyderabad? Yes, yes. The only and restaurant in the uh, Asian subcontinent where we have a dark restaurant. It's a very, very popular concept. And the Forbes magazine has listed this as 25 unusual experiments that you should do in your life. So I would like to invite all of you to come to Hyderabad to the Taste of Darkness, where you get to eat your food with the two most important senses of smell and taste. Any questions? Yes. Uh, the lady in red. Yeah, I'll come to you next. I saw that. Yeah. Where are the mics? Here. One mic there. Can you stand up, please, so they can identify you? Yeah. Thanks. I have been through that experience of dialogue in the dark and had a, f a first hand experience. Uh, I, I, I wish you could tell us about the workshops you conduct for organizations. Mm -hmm. So basically, Dialogue the Dark operates on three verticals. As um, Suresh rightly pointed out, we have a restaurant in complete darkness, uh, which is um, serving food in dark. Then we have an exhibition tour, uh, which happens in complete darkness to sensitize people on diversity, education, and social inclusion. The third thing that we do is the corporate workshops that we do for corporates in Dialogue in the Dark Center. Uh, largely aimed at takeaways like communication skills, team building skills, collaboration, diversity and so on and so forth. We also move to the next leg where we go to corporates and actually sensitize them about the how to uh, welcome a person with disabilities in workplace and things like that. Okay. Uh, the lady in the back, can we have the mic to you? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask that uh, what is the business model? Is there a business model at all? It looks like you're creating awareness and sensitizing people and changing behaviors. Good which question. in most cases is difficult to do business with. Good question. So what's the business model? Um, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting business model, um, not because we run it. I think uh, without your knowledge, you actually come into our Dialogue in the Dark Center and pay up 300 rupees to actually get into the da darkness space. So it's, it's extremely entertainment in the front end. So when people come to Dialogue in the Dark, they come to do adventure in darkness. Uh, they don't know that they are going to be encountering a blind person or a visually impaired person. They don't know uh, anything about the social message. So there's no social messaging in the front end as far as our business model is concerned. So people come into Dialogue in the Dark, 
pay 300 rupees, buy a ticket like a movie ticket, go into a half an hour or 45 minute experience, and the end of the experience, this whole social unfolding happens. So that's the business model when it comes to the exhibition tour. As I said, Taste of Darkness restaurant is like a regular restaurant where you actually pay for a combo meal or a four-course meal or for any of your biryani meals and stuff like that. Corporate workshops, again, people pay to be trained, people pay to be sensitized, and people pay for the services. So it's a very robust model. We have been in business for two years now. We have clocked a top line of close to 300 uh, lakhs, and uh, it's come from public. I have, no, a question no, yes. I have a question for you, Christian. So it seems like you're doing a great job, but it also seems like a curiosity to go once to an exhibition in the dark and to eat one meal in the dark. If I did it once, I'd take it off my list and said, I've done it, I won't go back there again. Aren't, ex aren't experiences like adve adventure, adventure tours or restaurants dependent on repeat customers? Are you, in a sense, killing your own customer base with one experience and I'm done? I think that's a very good question. Um, yeah, at the outset, it may look like a monumental value, like you go and visit a Salajang Museum or yeah. you visit a Gateway of India once and be done with it. In our experience, we've had repeat customers, which will constitute about 20 or 25 percent of our uh, business uh, volume. Um, but to answer your question, we keep changing the experiences. And we are extremely visible. We are in a mall. So we have a lot of uh, repeat uh, clients coming back and we keep changing the themes every three months or six months. So for example, last season when the uh, IPL started, we have a cricket in the dark. So where uh, there's no match fixing because fixing the bat on the ball itself is a great uh, task. So people come and play cricket in the dark. Okay. And um, before that we had a boat, boating experience in the dark. So we keep changing these themes every three to six months. So people do come back. And people do come back for these kind of new experience. We also have a customer retention program and things like that. We have a corporate offering. But to answer your question, yes, we need to have a wider audience rather than having the same audience coming back and forth every time. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. If you were asked to measure the impact you were doing uh, for your product, how would you measure that impact? I'm always struggling with that. So I've been asking most of the social scientists, how do I measure my impact? Literally, you're groping in the dark? <laughs> yeah, I would like somebody, uh, a social scientist, to shed some light on how we are impacting people in the dark. Uh, but on a more serious note, in terms of direct impact, I think it's more to do with uh, livelihood creation for people with disabilities. So till date, we have employed about 35 uh, visually impaired people who have come into Dialogue the Dark and gone out. An offshoot program is the Dialogue Diversity Exchange, where we are training people based on the Dialogue in the Dark experience to be placed in jobs outside of Dialogue in the Dark. But I would say the biggest impact that we have created, which perhaps cannot be measured at this point of time, is the sensitization that we are doing. Uh, 100,000 people have come in, 200 corporate leaders have come to Dialogue in the Dark, and we are talking to at least about 25 corporates who have come back and said, hey, I would like to employ a person with disability. It could be a hearing impaired, it could be a visually impaired, or it could be orthopedically challenged. So I think that mindset change uh, that we are trying to create through Dialogue in the Dark is phenomenal at this point of time, not because we are running it, we are seeing the fruits of it. At least 25 corporates are talking to us to create jobs in their own workplace. And it could probably take another six months' time for us to demonstrate that kind of uh, um, behavioral change into a quantitative output. So, otherwise, right. sensitization is the big task that we're doing. Krishna, I'm going to end it here. Thank you very much. It's Thank a fascinating you. story. Thank you. Our next candidate is Best First Step Learning. Can we have you on stage? India's future is hanging in balance. On one side is the youngest and largest workforce in the world. This is our demographic dividend. On the other side is a population in which only 25% has marketable skill sets, 35% is illiterate, and 25% has access to any form of training. Best First Step Education aspires to create livelihoods, sustainable livelihoods through skill training. We have created a strong value chain which connects the community, the government, the industry, and other enablers, and are able to provide high quality and cost efficient training solutions which lead to sustainable livelihoods. Over the last three years, we have trained and provided employment to over 10,000 people with a 96% uh, placement rate and at an average training fee of rupees 5,000. In the next five years, we will work towards creating capacity to train and enable livelihoods for 100,000 people every year. 
I am Aditya, founder and CEO of Best First Step Education Private Limited, and I passionately believe that if we work together, then we can transform the world. Thank you. Oh, we have some serious hooting in the back. Well done, Aditya. Thank you very the much. The first for finalists to get hoots from the audience. Right, so I have the first question for you. Yes. So you are a training institute like many other training institutes. What differentiates you? Are you able to train people faster, better, cheaper? I think first and foremost is that we target the category at the bottom of the pyramid which nobody targets. We basically work with young people in the age group of 18 to 30 okay. who are disadvantaged because economically they don't have the money to pay, academically because they have dropped out of school or college or cannot uh, access competitive entrance exams or geographically because they are located away from the urban agglomerate okay. and are therefore cut off from the mainstream. And what are these skills that you are teaching them? Basically, uh, like I said, uh, we span, uh, our solutions for livelihood span uh, school dropouts to graduates. Right now, over the last three, four years, we have concentrated in the services sector. Uh, but this year, figuring out that self-employment is very important, particularly for women and for the more economically challenged for whom migration is a very uh, debilitating uh, experience. Uh, so this year we plan to go in for certain technical trades and trades oriented to self-employment. And do your students pay you up front or do they pay you after they get jobs? And uh, they have no, we actually have a kind of a bifurcated model where uh, the people who can afford it pay full fees and we try and facilitate different levels of subsidy for the people who cannot afford to pay it uh, by not only cross-subsidizing uh, from the paying students but also creating subsidies from foundations, from governments and from the industry. Okay. All right. Questions? Yes. Lady in red again there. How do you invest in training of your trainers? Yeah, that's a very important question really because the first challenge with trainers is the availability of trainers in the first place. Uh, so as a result, what we try to do is that we uh, find people who have the education or particularly the work experience in this space and we have our own uh, pedagogy and content. So we train our trainers for at least 60 days uh, in our in-house uh, uh, training uh, facility and it's only then that they go on and start discharging classes. What kind of job placements and in what industries do the people that undergo this training? Uh, till now our focus, is, our focus has been in the services sector, so we work uh, towards training and placement in uh, sales and customer service, the pharmaceutical sector, the ITES sector, the banking and financial sector, etc. Uh, which are the areas, uh, where are you getting your students from? Are you metro centric, are you city centric, are you going into their hinterland? Uh, sir, we uh, geographically we work with students from rural, semi-rural, semi-urban and urban. And economically we work from uh, the category from below poverty line to middle class and above. Uh, a connected question to this yes. is that when you are working with the rural and semi-urban areas, the problem is that uh, there are no jobs in those areas. You can mobilize the people but the problem uh, which comes up is how to get them for a job to areas like the cities and bigger metros. Because uh, why I am saying this is because I am also something of a similar nature I am doing in Bihar. Yes, sir. The challenge is getting these people for jobs outside the state. Absolutely. So how, how are you addressing this problem? Absolutely. So at the outset, uh, migration is a very vexing issue, so we leave that aside. But uh, what we can do and what we have done is that uh, we work with over 200 uh, companies nationally for our placement. And because we offer a very value-added service to them, which is uh, essential to their business mix, we have negotiated certain specific benefits for our students. And uh, about 80% of the rural students have to migrate. And because we work in the eastern part of the country, the migration is regional, not even local. local. So these companies, for all 100% of the migratory jobs that we uh, offer, uh, these companies uh, mandatorily have to provide lodging facilities and they have to provide at least one uh, meal uh, per day. And other than that, all 100% of our uh, uh, recruitment, our employment, placement uh, is fully compliant in terms of minimum wages and statutory benefits and against appointment letters. And do these so, companies pay you a placement fee for placing the uh, students there? Sir, yes, uh, but uh, uh, for, the, for the people at the bottom, you know, for uh, people who are going for migratory jobs uh, at the, at the 5,000 rupee kind of a thing, we do not take fees from the recruiter and we translate that into benefits for our students, for the student. which is really okay. the, the lodging facility, etc. All right. Fair enough. Okay. Yes. One more question. Uh, so, what's the value for the students who pay? What's the value proposition for uh, you know? Given that you are talking about minimum wage jobs, why would somebody kind of pay to get trained on this if the placements? You know, what's the uh, uh, value proposition? Yeah. Not all jobs are minimum wage jobs. But having said that, the first value proposition is that uh, you know less than 
5% of the Indian population has any kind of marketable skill set. So the first value proposition is really going from unskilled and unemployed to skilled and employed. And having said that, you know, education and healthcare are two segments where I have often seen that consumers do not really look for a re return on investment. So all our, fee, all our fee structure is structured in such a way that the fee is one to maximum one and a half times the terminal salary. So basically you invest 5,000 rupees in a course, invest one month of your time, and you get a statutorily compliant job in a reputed organization of 5,000 rupees and above. So the return on investment is one month. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. Thank you. With that, we move to our final category. The category is called Technology for Development. And our first finalist in that category is called Avazde. Avazde Infosystems has developed a mobile platform with voice-enabled solutions for development agencies that are customizable in local languages. So, sorry, there is more? Oh, sorry. I think I missed it. Sorry. My fault. There's one more education category. It's called Hippocampus Learning Centers. My mistake. They, est they establish a chain of primary schools in rural areas to offer affordable and high-quality basic education to rural children. My apologies, Hippocampus. No problem. Um, I want you for a second to think back to when you were 10 years of age. Now imagine not being able to read a simple text or not being able to do a simple two-digit subtraction. The sad reality is more than 50% of children in India today cannot do that. And the majority of these children are in rural areas where they don't have access to education till age six. Now research has shown that the majority of learning, the fundamental foundation of learning starts between the ages of two to six. So these children are at a huge disadvantage by the time they reach class one. Hippocampus Learning Centers, we provide high quality, affordable early childhood education to rural India. We do so by having a strong curriculum. Um, we provide a safe and enabling environment for the children to learn, discover, and grow. And we train and employ local resources to be our teachers and our field operators. Our journey started with 10 centers in 2010, um, and today we have over 100 centers and over 3,000 children in the state of Karnataka. Our aim for the future is to find partnerships to continue to take this model beyond uh, the state of Karnataka to all of India and beyond. Thank you. Just so we understand your model, do you strengthen existing schools and learning centers or build your own No, we and open centers? and operate our own uh, early childhood education centers. Okay. Why is that more effective than strengthening the pre-existing schools and learning centers that already exist? There isn't, at a village level, there isn't any other alternative for early childhood education. So most of the, um, at a village, the only two options is either to go to an Anganwadi, which is a government uh, organization that focuses really on health, not on education, or the other alternative is a private school, which is really um, targeting affluent community, but also operate in a hub and spoke model. So a, a number of villages and they transport the children to one private school. We uh, operate under a localization model where we open and operate the centers locally in those villages of 700 to 2,000. Um, and how are you able to keep your education cheaper than a private school, for instance? Why is your model uh, more cost effective? I think, I think part of it is the localization, renting and operating locally. We recruit uh, local women uh, to be our teachers, and we provide them with a lot of training. Um, I think those are the core reasons why we're able to keep costs very low. OK. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Go ahead. As Suresh was saying, most of the rural areas do have schools. So you're saying they're not having schools, but they do have some kind of primary schools in, I mean, these villages. Correct. So we do not, just a correction, we do not operate primary schools. We do preschools, early child education centers. And the second thing that I want to clarify is in rural areas, there are schools. They just don't operate on a village level. Um, for early childhood education. So uh, we are operating in villages of 700 households and these villages do not have a school locally. They have to transport their children 
to a school that is, again, hop and spoke. Okay. Okay, I have one final question. So sure. it seems like a regular business running schools or preschools in villages. What makes you a social business? Why aren't you just a regular school business? I think um, for two reasons. One is providing access because they, these um, children wouldn't have had access without um, us coming in. And the second is the high quality. Um, a big problem in India is rote memorization and we're focusing on engaging children um, in the learning process and allowing them to really be educated, not schooled. Um, one of our teachers just told us a story about how uh, a parent was a little bit disconcerned of the fact that we weren't requiring her child to write. Uh, but by the end of the year, the neighbor's child, who went to a private school, was able to write the alphabet, but only in a chronological order, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, while our HLC child was able to write them uh, distinguishedly, as, as they were told. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Right, with that we move on to our next category, Technology for Development, and may I invite Awaz Deh onto stage? No, it'll take. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Just making sure everyone's there. All right. Uh, so in 2000, 2013, there will be 500 billion text messages, SMSs, sent in India alone. 500 billion. So that's more than the number of stars in the entire Milky Way galaxy. And that's in India, in a country where there are hundreds of languages and dialects spoken, where there is a significant population of illiterate people, and where there is a rich oral cultural tradition. And so you have to ask yourself, why is there so much text messaging happening, and by comparison, so little voice messaging. And so at my company, Awaze, we looked at that as an opportunity. We created a product called Streams, which people use for group voice messaging. So it works like a voice Twitter, and you use it in three easy steps. So step one is you create a group, a voice message group. Step two, you post a voice message, either over the phone or uploading it over the web. Step three, Awazde automatically sends your recorded voice message out to your group members through regular phone call. Okay, so people don't have to have a special device. They don't have to have a special app or software installed on their phone. They simply get a phone call. They pick up the phone and they hear your message. And not only do they hear it, they can also record uh, feedback to you, either voice or touch tone. That means you've run out of time. Is that it? Yeah, you get another 30 seconds to finish what you're saying. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, this is most useful in situations where uh, people are trying to reach people disconnected from the internet. So for example, agricultural enterprises use this to send agricultural advice to farmers in local languages. Hospitals can use it to share uh, patient reminders to take their medicine. Rural media can use it for uh, making an accessible uh, medium for people to access their headlines. Um, even you and I, people can use it for social purposes. So there's a person in Bihar named uh, Navneet who is a poet and he uses streams to be able to share his poems with his fans. So to, uh, we launched Awaz uh, Day streams in uh, eight months ago. Uh, over 300 groups have been created, reaching over 30,000 people through 100,000 phone calls, and we think that's just the beginning. So I have two requests. The first requests are for all the social entrepreneurs in the room. I invite you to sign up for a free tri trial of streams, because all of you are in some way or the other trying to connect with disconnected people. And this is exactly what this tool is designed for uh, you to, to help you with. The second uh, uh, request is for uh, investors in the room. So we have an exciting product which has a huge potential to reach and benefit the masses of Indian society. And we have a product that people are actually paying for. So I hope uh, if you're interested, you get in touch. All Thank right. you. That completes. Yes, questions. Yeah. Gentleman in the black t-shirt. The mic's on your right. Hi. Uh, what's the most effective thing you did for user acquisition and what's the least effective thing you did? <laughs> good question. Good question. So um, it's a really good question. So till date, uh, the, the way that we've been able to grow the, the user base of the product is primarily, almost exclusively through word of mouth. 
So some organizations I've heard about Awaze, they've started using uh, it to broadcast to groups. Some people who are receiving those messages in turn say, hey, this is interesting, maybe I can create my own groups. And in that way, it's sort of, it's sort of spread. We haven't really um, actively looked at specific ways that we can um, kind of uh, find pockets of usage. It's happened organically, so there's two examples of this. Uh, one organization in Bihar who is concerned with um, Narega scheme. So they try to increase the awareness around Narega programs and they also try to, um, they're using streams to also surface any kind of low level corrupt practices that are happening in the, in the scheme's implementation. So they were using streams beautifully in, in Bihar. And then they just, you know, their circle of Narega activists and NGOs um, shared that, hey, we're using this technology. And then all of a sudden, without our knowing, all of these groups in Bihar started using streams to, to broadcast in their, in their own way. So this was a nice example of how it sort of grew virally. Another quick example of that is in Gujarat, where um, there are uh, Krishi Vigyan Kendras. Actually, they're all over India. Are you familiar with KVK? So these are farmer field schools. So every district in India, it's a government program, has a KVK, uh, which is you know, tasked with disseminating agricultural in information to the farmers in their district. So there was one KVK in Kheda district in Gujarat who heard about streams and started sending messages, agricultural advice to their farmers, 2,000 farmers. And the farmers were thrilled. They loved it. And so this KVK invited us to a meeting where all the five KVKs in central Gujarat heard about or pre were presented this, this case study. And uh, the regional head said, hey, all of you five KVKs, you should now set up a stream by the end of the month and start broadcasting. So in that way, when you see the value in, in what's happening, people automatically sort of take to it. All right, thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're almost in the end. Three more, three more, three more contestants. Project Well Management has developed an innovative low-cost housing technology that allows for 80% off-site and 20% 20 20 on-site managing. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. The 90 seconds are yours. Hi, I'm uh, Parthajit. Uh, Project Well is one of the co-founding partners of this initiative, which we call ICH, or Ideal Choice Homes. Uh, Amber is a co-founder, so Amber is going to tell us the story. You might need to speak from the mic. I think your mic is not working. 100 years ago, uh, cars were handcrafted before Ford Motor Company uh, developed the assembly line technique and brought uh, affordability to uh, automobile to mass masses in the United States. Similarly, houses also 100 years back were handcrafted and they still are done brick by brick on the site. Now what that has done to an emerging economy or a urban, rapidly urbanizing country like India is to create a huge demand supply mismatch which currently is estimated at around 26 million units. So somebody who is earning let's say 15,000 rupees Today, the house is neither available and neither it's affordable because the way the financing system for housing is uh, structured as a collateral and income proof based. What we have tried to do is bring a solution which is a component based solution where we are tracking 70% of the construction processes off site, thereby reducing the on site construction time by around 80%. And this way, making a house available ranging from 3 lakh rupees to 10 lakh rupees. Uh, in a sense, it's also a, an attempt to look at the financing in a different fashion since these components are, uh, had a salvage value. So we are looking at a financing mechanism which, where they can be, uh, these, these can act as a collateral. You have now it's a huge more. business uh, opportunity of a hundred billion uh, market size and we are looking to create a very large scale social and economic impact by creating an ecosystem where large number of investors as well as delivery partner can work in making housing available for all, and that too a pakka and a solid house. Thank you. Housing that can be made off-site, 80% off-site and 20% on-site. Any questions? Isn't the bulk of the cost of the house the cost of the land itself? That's See? in uh, Mumbai and Delhi, where 90% is the cost of the land. In other cities, the formula is different? It's, yeah, it's different, yes. The and cost also, of construction is significant there? Yes. Okay. And also, you know, to address that point, the 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 conventional notion is that it's a capital appreciation model. The land is a capital appreciation. We are trying to bring an inventory-driven model where you, know, you construct and sell. Okay. <laughs> yes, go ahead, sir. Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, one question is that, is your technology suitable for high-rises or, you know, ground plus two structures or it's okay for both? 
And uh, the second question is your sales model. Do you tie up with developers or are you in the development business? Both good questions. Okay, the first part, R is a concrete panel-based solution because our study shows that in India, the acceptability and the demographics that we are trying to address requires a Pakka solid house. So there was a knock test and we did a study covering around 11 states in, in the country. So currently our solution can go ground plus three uh, because it's a concrete panel and we are, in our second phase, we'll be attempting uh, to go much higher. The second, as far as the business model is concerned, considering the market size, we don't want to be in the development so this guy will get uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know an alert along with two you know it can be your next door uh, relative uh, you know this guy and a control room is also set up and this uh, security guard will rush there in 5 to 10 minutes validates the situation if it is something uh, you know manageable to him and he will he will mobilize you know the appropriate and the nearest resources appropriate because a fire fire force is not you know, is not the person to act when there was a snake, uh, you know, thing, or even a police is not the person. So you need to connect to the re uh, appropriate and, uh, you know, nearest emergency response system. One major factor, we apply technology, you know, we are not a private security guard company or an emergency response company. What we have tried, we have, uh, you know, one, applied technology at the user end, made it simple, press two, nothing else. And who you know? pays you? And uh, the customer will pay just 100 rupees per month for, for uh, you know, uh, for, for their safety. And uh, they also get, you know, these guys, these private security guards, uh, they roam around the place, night patrolling, and then, uh, you know, uh, and at the end of every week, uh, on a Sunday, 4.30, they'll get a beat report, just like the Gurkhas in India. Is there a moral hazard there? What if I'm poor and I can't pay you 100 rupees a month? I don't deserve security? There is, a model is different. You know, one, you have got direct subscription. We are just targeting 10% of the urban population to subscribe to this. I just need 20% to, uh, as a threat threshold to okay. run the entire ecosystem, even including private security, guard, uh, private security guards. Uh, and what happens here, I have a model of sponsorship. See, jewelers, for example, a specific case in Kerala, jeweler can sponsor, they are actually selling insecurity, you know, thefts and small time, th uh, things like that. They will pack security with their insecurity. So okay. that's the kind of model. So we have a, a sponsorship model where I'm targeting 20% of the population, which is, again, if, if, I, if, I, if I have, uh, you know, 30% uh, of, of population or, or, you know, houses subscribing to this particular program, uh, you know, I, every single, uh, you know, uh, uh, private security guard against each and every private security guard, the security company will get 5 to 10% of that, what they get at present with the conventional model. They're getting 5,000. Who, who will work for, you know, 5,000 rupees at this moment? You will get, you know, retired people to work as security guards. Now, by, by getting them good money, they will actually, right. can, they can employ young and energetic people, make it a charming job, and then, you know, do the transformation. Be a part of, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the entire... Uh, uh, right. One final system. question for our final contestant. Yes, th that privilege goes to you. Any plans to scale this up by tying yeah, sure. up with the government agencies? Because definitely, they are definitely. supposed to do this. Uh, you know, see, sitting in Trivandrum, I can manage technology. You know, it's as simple as that. As, as I already said, it's it's going to be a Facebook of safety and security. Number two, my major challenge will be on the on the you know the private security garden. Though I'm not dealing with it, I need to attend to that uh, fundamental problem. So what we have, we have worked out in Kerala, uh, you know, in order to generate employment and things like that, there is a model of Kudumbusri in in in, in Kerala, which has been done by the Social Welfare Department. It's a social uh, self-help group kind of a thing. So government is going to do a, 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 a you know. A, uh, uh, a self help is going to develop or when I drive a self help group for uh, young and uh, young people and create employment even from the rural areas to do this process this is completely urban model at the moment but then this is my start and then I'll go to rural because the economics of rural areas are different so I will have a model for rural uh, places uh, you know uh, once once the city urban cities are developed what I'm planning is to 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 have this in 25 cities in next three years which is which is uh, which is practically possible because you know I'm not doing private uh, when it comes to scalability part of it my logistics are the biggest challenge there are three things which I'll do one you map there is something called I need safety map when, it, when I do a city which is mapping all safety resources uh, of that particular city uh, there number two engaging these private security guards enabling them with technology uh, number three is your control room 24 bar 7 which actually monitor this private security guard and measure the performance productivity efficiency everything of these private security guards all right i'm going so, to cut you off there because we're running out of time yeah. thank you thank you for answering thank the you. question thank you so you have much. more to say thank but so people need to catch you in private and grill you may i hand the stage back to melita
Well, ladies and gentlemen, with this, we have officially come to the end of Ideas for Impact session. Thank you once again to our lovely moderator, Mr. Suresh Venkat.